Welcome. Welcome to Hug Nation. It is May 3rd. It is the first Hug Nation after the announcement that bin Laden has been uh, killed. So the things that have happened since then are very interesting. Um, this is kind of an important time and a kind of an important event for the world, especially for Hug Nation. To give a little history, Hug Nation began much because of and in the wake of 9-11. So my experience at that time was right after 9-11, there was this amazing period, well, excuse me, right after 9-11, there was horror, loss, pain, frustration, just depth of feelings and un just hard to fathom. But very quickly that feeling, because it was shared beyond our borders, became this unifier. And there was this, I truly felt more optimistic and more hope than I've ever felt in my entire life in terms of, wow, maybe this planet, maybe the, the rails that this train is on, maybe this blow, as painful as it is, maybe this blow will get this train to jump the tracks and try another direction. And wouldn't that be a way to honor the people that died? But, very quickly, powers that be directed our attention and our thoughts towards shopping and then towards the enemy. And the enemy got vague. The enemy turned into a religion. The enemy turned into a people, a part of the world for a lot of people. And while the messaging didn't overtly mislead us, or maybe it did, a lot of people weren't misled. So by the time we were looking for WMDs in Iraq, huge numbers of people thought that we were going after the people responsible for 9-11, for vengeance, for justice. And as this was happening, this hope that I had just got weaker and weaker and weaker as the news kept starting talking about us, them, us, them, us, them. And at the time, the internet was new and it was so much potential. Here was this tool that literally connected the world. The idea of us and them meant so much less in the context of a web that connected us. And my experience personally, as I had traveled the world, was that people in Muslim countries, when you visit them face to face, they were so kind. They would invite you into their homes, they would feed you before they fed themselves. The, the experience of us versus them is a fiction. Us versus them is a story for the old world, the pre-connected world, the world of fear. And so Hug Nation, and so Hug Nation was a way to try to use this tool to remember that the world would rather hug you than hurt you or at least that there was vastly more people that would rather hug you than hurt you in this world. And so to take a moment every month, excuse me, to take a moment every week to remember that and to feel that connection and try to strengthen it in the people that also were aware and believing and trying to resonate like that. So it's been a long time. It's been a lot of weeks and a lot of hugs in the, in the time since then. And Hug Nation has evolved beyond those definitions and those purposes to being a much more general sense of connection and positivity and joy, all trying to return to that vibration of connection and, and love. I'm going to just read what I wrote. Rest in peace. Have you ever known a dog that had to be put down, one that was mean and vicious? Did you celebrate its death or feel sorrow for the circumstances that would create such a creature? I feel like America is like a horrible pit bull owner who created a mad beast, making it mean and sharpening its claws to fight. 
This animal fought other dogs for us while we rubbed its belly and threw treats into its cage. But over time, the dog realized it was caged. It saw through the ma manipulation of its master. The depth of abuse he and his litter had suffered was overwhelming. So the dog answered the injustice in the language it had been taught, violence. When the beast attacks its owner, the owner has two choices, stop treating creatures so cruelly or put the beast down. Actually, there's a third choice. Spend 10 years and obscene amounts of money to spill 20 times the blood of that first bite. I will not declaim to understand the financial or political objectives of those 10 years of violence. Clearly, powerful men made fortunes while poor men bled, and everyone in between paid for it. That we were manipulated by the circumstances is obvious. But now that the dog has finally been put down, I feel no glory or joy. I feel no sense of justice. I certainly don't feel like the violence is over. I only feel pity for a mean dead dog, frustration at the landscape of war we are now embedded in, and intense sorrow for the tens of thousands that died along the way. And then I followed it by a quote by Martin Luther King. Actually, this is the second part of the misquote that was went viral yesterday, but this is the part that is, as far as I know, is accurate. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. So it goes. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King, Jr. I really wanted to try to make this as non-political as possible and try to address concepts of humanity, concepts of morality, concepts of interconnection. Because politics are politics are politics, and once we dig in and try to defend our beliefs, our stances, this is not a discussion, it is, it gets ugly. One thing I couldn't help but think about, and I heard many people mimic this, is that when we saw scenes of joyful singing and waving of flags and chanting, we were literally dancing on someone's grave. And while we see that person as a terrorist, the line is not as black and white all over the world. Imagine if you grew up in a place where you didn't have access to an incredible education. Maybe people that you knew and loved had been killed by US forces, whether civilian accidents or they were a part of a military force, whatever, there's death in your family. And regardless of what the political issues are, you probably have a lot of hate and anger. And with a socialized system and a skewed news system and hand-me-down stories, how easy it would be to have hate for the people that caused the death of your sibling or caused, in your mind, some sort of atrocity or pain or suffering that you and your family have had to go through. Now, if you look at the ire and anger that is in our own country revolving around debates of health care, the, the violence, the shootings, the intense hate and anger revolving around health care. Can you not take the step and imagine how angry people could get when, when there's beliefs, whether they're right or not, of oppression, of imperialism, of religious indiscretions, thinking that this oppressor is on your holy land or whatever the, your cause may be, these are hot button issues. And to think that we can gloss over them with force and think that people are not going to be more angered. 
to think that killing a terrorist makes every angry person less angry at us that just seems and i've been accused i, I don't want to use this word i don't know the right word maybe it's naive one of the things that i really wanted to hit home about in response to the essay i wrote and the responses to it is that even if you feel like the other person is wrong even if you know they're wrong it can be very helpful to take a step back out of your anger and righteousness and justice equation and try to put yourself in their shoes try to imagine what it would be like to grow up around all this anti-imperialism attitudes grow up around people that have been hurt and injured at the hands of these big global Christian forces try to imagine what it would be like to be re receiving news that is totally skewed that's not hard to imagine if you look at I mean you know how angry you get watching certain channels on the news And imagine how much argument you would get into somebody that believes that news if they're one-on-one. -on -one. Now imagine how much more skewed that would get from another country with whole other religious and political and leadership and role models. And so even though you know they're wrong, can you see how in their perspective they are acting righteously? And if you can even see a glimpse of how they could possibly have that perspective, could you see how if you were put in those shoes, you could feel that way too? Yes, we all have a choice. But the choices we have, the way we respond to them, is absolutely a product of our experiences, our teachings, our socialization. And if you think you are acting purely isolated, without the impact of your culture, then I don't use this word lightly, but that is ignorant. That is naive. Part of growing up and waking up is recognizing how much of our belief system is put upon us by our culture. Look at body types and what is sexy through the years in different cultures. It is, it comes from the outside, what we value, what we think is cool what we think is unfair. And so if you can see just a glimpse of how they might think they're right, imagine how they'd feel if you danced on their graves. So if we want to stop the blood, we have to honor these skewed beliefs and try for justice not vengeance. Peace, not winning. You only live once. Enjoy the color.